This is the Sony a7S III. I've had this camera for over two months now, I've been actively testing it in Dubai, shot over 10 hours of footage with it, and although it's really impressive, it, and I might be the first one to say this, but it might not be the right camera for you. And I know it sounds like an absolute clickbait, but I promise you it's not. So watch this video till the end to find out why, but for now, I give you a full review of the Sony a7S III, where instead of talking bullshit behind the table, I'm gonna present you a ton of dope footage from Dubai and all the things I love and hate about this camera. And as a long-term Sony a6500 user, which was my main workhorse for the last four years, I'll just briefly compare these two and talk about the things that have been improved with the a7S. So let's get to it. So first, that sweet 10-bit 422. Gundar has already told you this in the first impressions video, but the colors are simply fantastic. It almost feels illegal that you can take this flat-ass looking S-Log3 footage to something presentable in like 10 seconds, literally just applied contrast, hue and saturation, and it it looks so good already. I mean, look at the skin tones. They're not yellow, the blues are not magenta-ish like on the previous Sony cameras, and it's just that good. Here's another example. Bit of contrast, saturation, hue, and more saturation, and we're good. So Canon users, I don't wanna hear any bitching about the color science of this camera. It's gotten really good. And it's not like I color grade all of my shots this quick. I still might spend 10 to 20 minutes on a single clip, but I'm just showing you how quick and easy it is to get a usable look from S-Log3. And yes, I shoot S-Log3 99 percent of the time since I always like to have the best dynamic range and this camera delivers it. Now this doesn't mean that you can shoot directly into the sun and perfectly recover shadows. In fact from my testing both the a6500 and the a7S III have the exact same dynamic range but one thing the a7S III really excels at is noise and the roll-off of shadows and highlights. Here's a random shot of me pretending to be a model. Both cameras have the exact same white balance and picture profile settings and yet they look so different. First let's get back to the colors a little bit. You can see that even with the same settings, the a6500 is a lot cooler temperature-wise, while the a7S III shows more of the warmer colors. Now you might think that the a6500 wins here because the walls are closer to white, and that's because these cameras handle white balance a little bit differently, so for the sake of this test I adjusted it real quick so they match up, and now I want you to focus on the skin tones. You can clearly see that the a6500 exaggerates the red spots a lot more, and has this magenta tint to the skin, while the a7S III just perfectly transitions between these colors and makes everything feel super smooth. And if we get back to the dynamic range, check out the highlight roll-off on the face. Again, the a7S III is just a lot smoother and a lot more pleasing, which doesn't mean that the a6500 is trash, in fact it's still very very close and totally comparable, but it just won't perform that good in lighting situations which are more tricky, like shooting from a room, through a window, or trying to recover shadows in a bright sunny day, because not only the roll-off is less smooth, but it also produces more noise in the shadows, which is something that the a7S III handles beautifully. Check out the scene from the mosque. This was absolutely the brightest day ever and yet the highlights are not clipping and the shadows are not noisy. In fact, for this shot I even purposely made it darker to create more depth. But if I take that node and reverse it, just look at that and there's pretty much no noise at all. And yeah, although these cameras have the exact same stops of dynamic range, the a7S III is the clear winner since you don't have to worry about the noise in the shadows. Next, the frame rates. As you know, this camera can shoot 4K in both 60 as well as 120 FPS in the same 422 10-bit, so no quality loss whatsoever. Now I have to apologize for that, I didn't get a chance to test out the 120 FPS in Dubai due to the fact that I couldn't find those UHS-2 SD cards anywhere. And speaking about that, I know you will be asking which SD card should you buy, and most YouTubers will tell you to get these UHS-2 V90 cards from either Prograde or Lexar, which could cost up to $190 for a 128GB card, which is nuts. Now, my personal recommendation is to get these V60 cards from Lexar instead, which are just $50 for the same amount of storage, and the only thing you lose is the ability to shoot all intra, which is that crazy ass format that produces a slightly better quality image, which I don't see any difference in, and yeah, the file sizes are like 3 times bigger, which means that we will most likely never use this format, and thus we got these V60 cards and we're all happy. Okay, then a surprising one the IBIS. Not perfect by any means, but this shot right here was done handheld at 300mm, and although it does have some shake, it's not that bad looking shake with micro jitters and that sort of thing. And for this shot, I actually like that it's there, makes it feel more natural and dynamic. Then this shot right here, same thing, except this time I'm at 400mm, and I'm on a boat, which is swaying in the waves. In fact, all of the clips in that little intro sequence at the beginning, except these four, were shot handheld, and during my two months in Dubai, I used my gimbal maybe 
like four or five times total, which just shows how much I like the image stabilization, especially when you combine it with the 60 and uh, or 120 FPS. But again, don't expect to do a perfect follow or an orbit shot. For that, you still want to use a gimbal. Oh, and there's also that option to use the active steady shot, which I don't really like since it feels like an in-camera warp stabilizer. Like sometimes it works and sometimes it just fucks up your shot. Like here, I was walking very slowly, very carefully, and the results are worse than with the steady shot turned off. So yeah, not using that shit. Okay, now the thing that makes the A7S III the A7S III, the low light performance. Dual freaking ISO, baby. You might be shooting S-Log3 at 5000 ISO and think, well, the noise is terrible, what do you mean? Well, you might have heard this already, but if you crank it up to 12,800, it magically cleans itself up. And essentially, this is the same as shooting with the base ISO, which is crazy. And yes, I did a test where I compared 640 ISO shot to a 12,800 ISO shot, and they are almost the same. Like, you will see the noise if you look for it, but other than that, especially if you apply just the slightest bit of noise reduction, it will go by unnoticed. And yeah, I believe this is an important thing to know if you suddenly run into a dark room and have absolutely no time to take off your ND filter. Anyway, I was so blown away by this and how little I have to worry about when shooting in the dark. And sometimes when cranking it up to 12,800, I'm forced to close down my aperture to like f4 or f5.6. Can you believe that? But this doesn't mean that you won't be getting any noise when shooting in the dark. Because if your lighting conditions suck and you have no idea what the hell you are doing, your a7S III footage will look worse than what I can do with my GoPro. Also, fun fact, this camera can literally see in the dark. This was shot at like 500,000 ISO, I believe, and when I was sitting in this room, I could barely see just a figure of my friends that were sitting next to me. Like, I can see more with this camera than with my own eyes. It's crazy. Okay, and then the little things, like the monitor. Coming from the A6500, I'm so happy for the fact that it doesn't dim when shooting 4K. Like, after five years, I can finally clearly see when I'm filming. Can you believe that shit, man? Then the battery, oh my god, it's good. During these two months, I was never able to kill even two batteries in a single day. Gundars, however, his ass is in Mexico at the moment, and he was shooting like a maniac, 4K, 120 FPS the whole day, pretty much non-stop, and he was somehow able to kill seven Z batteries in a day. I I don't understand how. I'm gonna make a documentary about this, but yeah. Battery life for me is perfect, and if we compare it to the A6500, one of these Z batteries will last as long as three of these. Then, I like the fact that the movie mode is right next to the photo mode, and the fact that it keeps the specific settings you set for each one. Meaning, if I go into the movie mode and set it to S-Log3 and white balance 5600, and then switch back to photo mode, it doesn't transfer that information, and I don't have to adjust a single thing. And then you switch back and can shoot S-Log3 right away. Way. That just helps a ton when there's that one annoying person who suddenly asks for a photo while you're doing a video. And speaking of photos, I know this is a filmmaking channel, but photos are still important to me, since I'm usually doing time lapses in my travels. Now, that's more of a thing I do in nature though, so I didn't capture any in Dubai, but I did a ton of photos and I have zero complaints. They are banger, the colors look amazing, skin tones, amazing, see it for yourself. Never had an issue with the fact that it's only 12 megapixels, so I don't know why people are bitching about it. The only thing you don't want to do is buy this camera with the intention of taking photos and not videos. Yeah, I actually saw a guy on Facebook group who did that. But yeah, as a casual photographer, it does it for me 100%. And now, when I'm back in Latvia, I had a chance to play a little bit more with the time lapses, and I love it. The fact that you don't need an intervalometer is very nice, and I mapped this time lapse shooting function to this button right here, and again, it takes me just 3 seconds to switch from fully shooting S log to shooting time lapses. Super convenient. Okay, what else? The record button is super convenient as well. Gamma display assist actually works this time and is super helpful. Previously, it just made the colors maybe a little bit too intense. And although it made the screen brighter, it made it harder to nail the exposure for some reason. On the A7S III, however, I use it constantly. It's a great tool to see if your white balance is correct. And it's just nicer to look in that monitor when you can see contrast and colors. Then, the fact that it has dual SD card slots allows you to simultaneously record on both cards, which is something that I'm gonna use often. It just makes my heart at peace knowing that I have a backup there. Oh, this camera has a headphone jack as well, which yeah, I didn't have before, and the viewfinder is great, and I love having it. And if you're wondering why I didn't pick up the FX3 instead, I did actually visit the Sony store in Dubai and played with it a little bit, and although I like the grip and feel in the hand a lot more, and that flippy screen being more sturdy and easier to flip out, that's actually one thing I don't like on the A7S III. The screen just feels a little bit too fragile when it's out, and it's not that ergonomic to flip it out at all. With gloves, I can't even do that. But yeah, although the FX3 fixes all of these things, I just 
just didn't feel like spending those extra $400 for it. In my case, the A7S III was on sale and the difference was almost $800, which is not worth it in my opinion. If I had that cash just laying around somewhere, I might pull the trigger, but otherwise, no thanks, and I'm totally happy with my decision. Okay, enough with the good stuff. What is it that I don't like about this camera that much? I mentioned the flippy screen earlier, and yeah, it just feels too fragile compared with the A6500. I fear that if I accidentally trip and land on the screen, it could break off easily, while the Sony A6500 screen is very solid, hinges made out of metal, and I never have to worry about it. Then the video files are a little bit bigger, but not that much. I recorded a one minute video in each frame rate, and here are the file sizes if you're interested. But when it comes to editing those files, your computer will most likely start to struggle. I have a fully specced out 2019 MacBook Pro 16 inch, and while it's not like I'm forced to create proxies all the time, at least not for simple talking head videos, for anything else like a travel video, b-roll sequences, or anything where I would do a playback often, I will have to create proxies and generate optimized media when I work in DaVinci Resolve. But I'm kind of used to it at this point. When I'm working on a bigger project, I just import everything, drop it on a timeline, and leave the computer creating proxies overnight. After that, it's smooth as butter and really not an issue at all. And I'll take better image quality over a workflow with no proxies any day of the week. So then, some of you might ask, well, does it overheat? I personally never had an issue with that. I was shooting 4K 50fps in 40 degrees Celsius all the time in Dubai, and while I was sweating balls and the camera was extremely hot to the touch, the overheating sign never even popped up. Gunders, on the other hand, is shooting 4K 120fps all the time like a maniac in Mexico, and he says that yes, it does overheat when shooting 120fps for long periods of time, which is something to keep in mind, but shouldn't be a deal breaker since most likely you won't be shooting tons of 120 fps content anyway. Well, at least I won't. I'm sticking with 25 and 50 99% of the times. And I know some of you might ask, well, is there even a point in shooting 25 fps? Isn't it better to just shoot everything in 50 so you have the option in post? Well, yeah, but not all the time. If I'm shooting a talking head video, I'm going 25 fps to reduce the file size, or if I'm doing a tracking shot like this one, it wouldn't look so good in 50 or 100 fps, because you would be increasing your shutter and thus getting less motion blur. And for things that you want to look faster, powerful, and more dynamic, the motion blur you get from 1 50th of a second while shooting 25 fps is just way more effective. Alright, this video is getting a bit too long, so before I end, I want to address the thing I said in the intro, why this might not be the right camera for you. So, people have made so many videos saying that it's the best camera on the market, that it's a masterpiece, the new king of low light, and uh, I praise this camera as much as those YouTubers, but I believe this creates too high of an expectation. After people consume all of those videos, I feel that they start to think that this camera is the solution to all of their problems, that it has unlimited dynamic range, that it always produces perfect skin tones, and you don't have to do anything in post to make it look good, and that it's so good in low light that you can get perfectly usable footage in a pitch black room. Look, although the dynamic range is amazing, there are still some times where I could be spending 20 to 30 minutes on a single clip because I just can't get good colors out of it. Like this shot, for instance. The lighting conditions here were just a little bit too harsh, and the sky was very bland, has no contrast. Same thing with low light. It doesn't mean that this camera doesn't produce any noise. If your lighting conditions are horrible, it's gonna look like trash, I guarantee you. And to be honest, I'm also gonna be one of those guys who is gonna say that this camera is amazing, but that doesn't mean that it has no limits. And if you have no idea what the hell you are doing with your A7S III, I will make your footage look like shit compared to what I can get with my 5-year-old A6500. It's not like you're gonna buy this camera and become the next Sam Calder. I know this seems obvious to a lot of you, but me and Gunders have seen several videos on Facebook and YouTube of people posting their videos shot with the A7S III, and they look horrible, like really bad. We just couldn't understand how, but that's how it is. People just focus too much on getting the best tech for everything. If a rich dad decides to try out filmmaking, he's not gonna buy a point and shoot. No, he will go to the camera store and ask what's the best camera for filmmaking. I made a whole video about the gear doesn't matter thing, so if you have time or you and your girl are bored, check out the video and uh, save a few thousand dollars. Okay, but all I'm trying to say is, if you currently own some of the older Sony or Canon cameras that don't shoot 4K60 or don't offer 10-bit colors, I don't want you to stop making content and save up money uh, just until you have enough to afford the A7S III. On this channel, we've been showing it for years that you can still get banger footage from an old camera that still shoots 8-bit, doesn't have the best color signs, doesn't have 4K60, and the screen makes you question your eyesight. And you might be wondering what's going to happen with my A6500. Will I sell it? No, simply because its image quality is still very good all these years later. I was actually doing a few interviews in Dubai where I used both the A6500 and 
7S III, and I was able to match the colors quite well. So this is going to be my backup camera or my time-lapse camera since it's so light and compact. I'm actually amazed of how small this camera body is. I never really noticed it until I used my A7S III for a month and then picked this one up again. It's very impressive and it's hard to believe that all of the previous content on this channel was shot on this little bad boy. And if you're just starting out as a filmmaker and can find a good deal on it, I totally still recommend this camera. Well, maybe the A6400 instead since the screen doesn't dim or the A7 III actually. People are selling those cameras like crazy. I found some on eBay for like 500 bucks, are you kidding me? Like don't even think about it, just get it and start shooting, start learning. But for those who want to get the A7S III, it's a fantastic camera and a fantastic value. If I had to rate it, it would be a solid 10 out of 10, despite all those small issues I have with it, with the screen and file sizes and everything. And yes, it is going to be my main workhorse for the next four to five years, and I'm super excited about what we're going to shoot next with it. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it was helpful and stay tuned for all the upcoming content we'll shoot on these cameras. In that case, like this video and subscribe and you know the drill. Peace out.